Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to thank John Skeef, as well as West Philadelphia Community Center for inviting me to speak on my subject matter, the African presence in early America before Columbus. Not only the African presence in early America, but the profound scientific and technological aspect that the Africans left on America's first civilization called Omec. I'd like to say, first of all, why am I here? Why am I doing this subject compared to other subjects that, and of course, there are many subjects we can talk about when we're dealing with the African genius. Uh, as you may have seen in October of last year, in 1991, PBS aired a seven-hour miniseries on Christopher Columbus and the Age of Discovery. It dealt with the adventures of Marco Polo, Columbus and his maritime voyages, the Chinese and their maritime skills, the Arabs and their trade routes, the adventures of Columbus and Vespucci, etc., etc. However, when it came time to deal with the African factor, they strictly dealt with the Africans as slaves replacing the Native Americans. Now, personally, I felt that that was rather rude. It was offensive. And then again, in Newsweek magazine, in fall issue of uh, 1991, the fall winter issue, once again, they had uh, When Worlds Collide, How Columbus Voice Transformed Both East and West. And they showed the Native American civilization before and after European contact. However, once again, the African was shown as nothing more but slaves, front cover, replacing the Native Americans. Now, the sad part is that most scholars want to deal with the African factor strictly during the slave period. This is a big celebration that's taking place this year. It has tremendous backing from the United States, Spain, Italy, etc. You cannot stop this celebration. It's a year-long celebration from now up until October of 1993. So it has tremendous backing. The problem I felt, the problem I had with this was that, yes, the Holocaust of enslavement by Europeans was in effect at that particular time. However, all of Africa was not colonized. The slave period basically started on the outskirts of West Africa. But during that same period in West Africa, right in this area here, Senegal, Gambia, Mali, Timbuktu. You had thriving civilizations going on. You had the University of San Corre at Timbuktu. Mm -hmm. You had the University of San Corre. Not only did you have the University of San Corre, but Africa was still in a period of intellectual enlightenment. This university was not destroyed until 15. 1991. The Holocaust of enslavement was almost 100 years old, and the Africans in the Western Sudan at the University of St. Korea at Timbuktu were still going through a period of intellectual enlightenment. In 1492, when the Moors, in partnership with the Arabs, were expelled from Spain, many of those same Arab professors and scholars went into the university into West Africa, into the University of San Corre, and tried to apply for teaching positions that they weren't even qualified for. Nevertheless, the African professors were endowed with great chairs, chairman of this department, chairman of that department. You had African professors who were solicited to teach in Northern Africa, at Fez, at Cordova. These African professors were teaching 10 subjects, 10 different subjects, and teaching them well. The greatest scholar of that day, Ahmed Baba. He is one professor that had as many as 1,600 books. And, t and, and not only did he have 1,600 books, he wrote 47 books on different subjects. One man. And not only did he write these subjects, he was the same man that was solicited all up and down fairs, Cordova, in Spain, to teach Ahmed Baba. Then you had Mohammed Khoury. 50 years, the mayor of Timbuktu, 50 years, that's African consistency and African genius at its finest. 50 years, nobody wanted the job. He wanted to give it up. I don't want it no more. Take it. Nobody wanted the job. One mayor, 50 years, Timbuktu, that's what you had during that particular period of time. Now, what was going on? Because, see, when you talk about Christopher Columbus, this is mixed up with so many other things, and you have to understand why the African factor, the African genius, is set aside and left out. What was going on during that time? What was happening? You cannot talk about that if you don't talk about the Moors, Africans, in partnership with the Arabs and Berbers. 
Let's go back. 1492, let's go back about 200 years. What was going on in Europe? What was going on in Africa? You have to tie this in with what's going on in the history of the world at that particular time. In Africa, you had the most prestigious university, the University of Timbuktu, University of San Corre at Timbuktu. What was going on in Spain? The Moors were still in power. Who were the Moors? The word Moor comes from the Greek word moros, which means dark or black. These Moors who were Africans were in partnership with the Arabs and Berbers. At that time, you had the University of Salamanca, built around 1200 AD, the most prestigious university and one of the oldest universities in Europe, solely controlled by Moors in partnership with the Berbers. Who are the Moors? What do they look like? I don't have to go into too much detail because most of you have seen the golden age of the Moors by Ivan Van Sertema and he done an excellent job and for the first time since J.A. Rogers we had a body of African, predominantly African and African American scholars who took old information as well as new information and combined this information and did a hell of a job on that book. You must get that book. But since I'm here. Let me just give you an idea of what I'm talking about before I get into that subject. What do some of those Moors look like? This is what they look like. Black-skinned, woolly-haired Africans in Spain, in Italy, all throughout Europe, in southern France, in Germany. What else do we have? Crowns on their head, heraldry. Many Europeans during that time was tracing their ancestry by way of the Moors. What else do we have? Very, very important here because you don't see it that much. You had the Moors who introduced the game of chess into Europe. Not only did you have them introduce it, it came by way of India by an Indian philosopher who called it Katawanga. What is that? It symbolized four-legged limbs of two opposing teams, the infantry, infantry the, the chivalry, the elephants, and the chariots. What else did you have? It was these same Moors. At that time, Europeans called this a form of gambling. They were against it. But it was the same Moors. This is taken from the chess book of Alfonso the Wise around the 12th century AD. You have black-skinned, woolly-haired Africans, commonly called Moors at that time, playing the game of chess. And you can see through their elaborate garments that these were expensive garments. Right. It was said in Tony Brown's journal that the Moors took on as many as eight people simultaneously blindfolded and defeated them. Right. Eight people, and that's African genius at its finest. Amen. It was these same Moors in partnership with the Arabs and Berbers that introduced 17 universities to Europe. Seven. The crankshaft, the windmill, the pen pension gear, the first postal system, the common bath, soap all introduced by way of the Moors. At that time, the Catholic Church felt that once you were baptized, you did not have to take a bath anymore. So as a result, this is how the plague took place. Because at that time, Europeans were not washing up, and sadly, it wasn't the masses, it was the elite, the e e ecclesiastical. They were the ones who said, once you were baptized, you did not have to wash up anymore. And that plague was worse than AIDS. It killed 50% of the population at that time. Even after the Moors had introduced the common bath, many Europeans decided to give it up. Some scholars argue it happened because the prostitution was expensive, but we do know they gave it up. And the book, in the book called Dirt, D-I-R-T by Terence McLaughlin, English historian, he claims that not only did they give it up, even he even has a passage in there where the Moors wrote about the filthy smell and how many Europeans at that time would pawn their jewelry and what have you to the Catholic Church. And what happened was, and this is documented, all documented, I got the details, and there's no need to be sitting up here saying something if I can't back it up. This is not lip service. These same Moors, after they introduced these, these things into Europe, these advances into Europe, many of them just said, look, we don't want to deal with it. They called the Moors infidels at that particular time. 17 universities. What else did they do? They introduced ammonia, camphor, alcohol, sesame seeds, ginger, pistachios, nuts, raisins, all of these things we take for granted, even apothecary, that is storehouses for medicine, commencement exercises. You did not have caps and gowns and graduations till you had the Moors, 
These are Africans by way in partnership with the Berbers and Arabs who introduced this. Europe did not have their first hospital until the 14th century. Very, very important. This is why when you deal with that subject, they always talk about the Arabs in partnership with the Jews, but never want to deal with the African factor. One man, Zarib, commonly called the Blackbird, he is one man who changed the whole eating style of Spain. He introduced what is called new haircut styles, introduced new fashions. At that time, Europeans only had two fashions. He introduced four different fashions for summer, winter, and fall. He introduced the Spanish meatball, asparagus, etc., etc. But see, what's important about this, and then I'm going to get to my subject, you have to tie this into what happened 10 years ago. 1983 will mark the 10th anniversary of something that we forgot about. I mentioned the Moors, and I mentioned the game of chess. I mentioned how they took on eight people one time blindfolded and defeated their opponents. But it's something that we forgot because we do not hold our history sacred. The same thing happened right here in Philadelphia 10 years ago. You had a record to to this day has not been broken. Nobody has ever won two consecutive chess teams back to back. It is the African genius at its finest that still holds that record. What am I talking about? We forgot about him. United States champions, local Douglas Elementary School and Vox Junior High Chef both won United States, cha States Championship seven consecutive times. Not only did they win it, but you had one African-American genius at that time, the best African-American chess, uh, chess person at Vox. Here's the same man that took on as many as three people blindfolded simultaneously and defeated them in the heat of the sun. Okay, that's African genius being transformed from eight here to three here. One man, that's African genius. That's what I'm into. That's what I'm going to talk about. Now, how does Columbus fit into this? Where does Columbus come in at? What was happening? We got to go to the facts. Can't talk if you can't back it up. Got to go to the facts. January 1492, what happened January 2nd? The Moors, in partnership with the Arabs, were expelled from Spain. What happened? How does Columbus come into this? Christopher Columbus, who was also known as Christopher Cologne, Cologne means dove and Christopher means Christ, dove of Christ, AKA known as Christopher Columbus. It was Christopher Columbus, and, we, and then where's my sources? The Diaries, Voyages, and Journals of Columbus by John Boyd Thatcher. It is 2,140 pages. The footnotes by itself is another book within itself. You can get lost just in the footnotes. Now go back and read They Came Before Columbus by Dr. Ivan Van Sudermer. Read all of chapter one. He based that whole chapter off of that book by John Boyd Thatcher. But it is Columbus who says that he witnessed the expulsion of these Moors. Not only did he witness this, but he wrote about it. Who was the last king of Granada? If you've seen Dr. Van Sertima's book, it was called The African General Bo, Bo Abdil, also known as Abu, who surrenders to, the, to Queen Isabella and Ferdinand. He's an African general, and you know Dr. Van Sertima is very little he says if he can't back it up. That's the last general of Granada. Christopher Columbus seen when this man was expelled from Spain. Not only did he see it and bear witness to it, he wrote about it. The sad part about this general is that at that time, you had the two predominantly African dynasties, the Amoravids and the Amahadids, strictly African dynasties. They said to Queen Isabella and Ferdinand, the king and queen of Spain, if you want Granada, you come get it. That we're going to die, but if we die, we're going to die as strong African men and women. What did the African general do? He tried to make concessions with King, Queen, uh, King Ferdinand. What did he say? Perhaps we can make some type of a deal. If you give me a certain part of my land, if you give me certain things, if you let me keep the religion, then I will release Granada. The masses didn't want to buy that. They didn't even know he was making a deal. Queen, King Ferdinand seen the dispute between the masses, Africans, and their leader, Bo Abdul. What did he say? 
Look, I'm not waiting for them to decide what they're going to do. Let's go after them. They fought. The sad part is that the Africans eventually were defeated. Now I don't know what they defeated, but then they said that this general, he weeped. He was sad. He didn't like what was going on. It hurted him. And if you understand and you see the architect of Granada, you see that grandeur, that magnificent, magnificent structure, you will see why he was hurt. Unbelievable when you see what that looked like. It was built right around the time of that Amoravid and Amahides dynasty. But his mother, Aisha, said to him, and she was right, you weep like a woman for what you could not defend as a man. Mm. And this same African general died in another war helping another African kinsman. But yet and still, he felt a nonviolent person that, you know, it's better if I can make some type of deal with the king and queen of Spain. Now, January 2nd, 1492, Columbus sees this, he witnessed this, and I'd like to read to you what he said. I'm reading from page 286. You have to hear this, word for word. This is Columbus. I'm quoting strictly from Columbus. It's in Spanish, and it's in English. He sat there, and he bare witness to this. And the sad part, the reason why this is sad, because Columbus also said, in my intercourse and conversations, I have been with learned patients, ecclesiastical as well as circular. I learned from Indians and Moors. I study history and philosophy. I sat at the foot of the Moors. So he's telling you that he learned from the Moors, but yet and still, he witnessed their expulsion. And I'm going to read to you what he says. Page 435, I'm sorry, page 435, chapter 1. This is what he said. Listen to this. January 2nd, 4th, this is Columbus. He sees this. Because most Christians are very exalted and very excellent and very powerful princes, king and queen of the Spains and of the islands of the sea, our Lord in the present year of 1492, after your highness has made an end to the war of the Moors who are reigning in Europe, and having finished the war in the very great city of Granada, where in this present year, on the second day of the month of January, I saw the royal banners of your highness placed by force of arms on the towers of Alhambra to the gates of the city. Let me start over. I saw the royal banners of your highness placed by force of arms on the towers of Alhambra which is the fortress of the said city. And I saw the Moorish king come out to the gates of the city and kiss the royal hands of your highness and of the prince, Lord, and then in that same month, because of this information which I have given your highness about the lands of India. So he witnessed the expulsion of the Moors and the same man said he sat and learned extensively from the Moors and turned the other cheek. So what happens now? 1492, Columbus, he begins to do what? He seeks money, funds, to travel and make his voyage of contact to the new world. Finally, the Moors are expelled. The king and queen decides to give him finance to what he need, among other people who gave him finance. Now he's on his way. I'm not the first one who mentioned Africans in America before Columbus on his second voyage and what is called Haiti, back then called Hispaniola, it was Christopher Columbus who went there on his second voyage and it was the Indians, the Native Americans who told him that black people were coming from the south and southwest in large boats trading gold-tipped metal spears. Now at that time, he wasn't sure if they were Africans. He felt that maybe they could have been Native Americans or Indians with dark skin. However, it was the Spanish metallurgists who took those gold-tipped metal spears back to Spain, had them analyzed, and found that they had the same copper, not similar, the same identical alloy of copper, gold, and silver ratio that was being alloyed and produced on the west coast of Guinea. Furthermore, the Native Americans was using the same word for gold-tipped metal spears, guanin, guane, kane, and it has the linguistic similarity as that of the west coast of Guinea. Not only that, but you have three major currents, three currents. 
You have the Senegambia current. You have the Cape Verde current. You have the South Equatorial current. And actually four, you have the Canary Islands. These are four major currents right off the coast of Africa. If you get caught in these currents, whether you're a bone, a stick, a nail, whatever, if the fish don't eat you first, you will automatically come to America. These currents, and I should show you this, four currents. Here's Africa, Canary Islands, Cape Verde, Sydney Gambia, all right here, natural currents that will automatically bring you into South America. The Canary currents flow southward off the coast of uh, the Cape Verde, and it gets its currents from Sydney Gambia and will bring you right into South America. Then you have the Cape Verde. It leaves Africa, it leaves Africa into the Caribbean, into the Gulf of Mexico, it swings back off the Florida coast, and then it comes back by way of Europe and Africa. You have the Senegambia current. It takes you into South America, into the Caribbean, into the Gulf of Mexico, and it possibly swings back. The South Equatorial current takes you into the Gulf of Mexico, into the Caribbean. Four natural currents. Furthermore, Africa has the advantage because at its nearest point, it is only 1,500 miles away from South America. Mm. Europe is twice as far. So those you have natural currents. Furthermore, in 1462, the Portuguese noticed a whole lot of cotton that was being planted or that was being grown in the, uh, the Cape, uh, Canary Islands, which is right off the African coast. And they thought that this was indigenous. They thought this was an African cotton. But they found out they were wrong. And as you have heard through Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, this was, a, this was a, a foreign cotton. It was called Garcipium hirsutum varpustatum. This was an American cotton that made its way into Africa. Then you had an African cotton, cultivated cotton, Garcipium hirsutum and Gar Garcipium barbadens that merged and you had a new cotton. You had, and they tested this, they had 26 chromosomes, 13 African and 13 European. Now at first they felt, well, we're not sure if in fact Africans bought it here. It could have came here by way of a transatlantic voyage. Maybe the currents brought this in. And they tested this, found out, didn't happen. They tested it and what did they look for? Three things. Buoyancy, what is buoyancy? The tendency or capacity for cotton seeds to remain afloat. Viability, are they capable of living? Are they capable of developing under favorable conditions? Okay, they found out that when they tried these and tested these in salt water, the cotton sank. Did not have the potency to travel to the new world. So then they said, well, we know what happened. Birds brought them over. But they found out birds don't eat cotton balls or seed for lunch or dinner and that birds were regurgitated. Now, we have the documents, here it is. Volume 100, The American Naturalist, number 912, The Potentiality for Long-Range Oceanic Disposal of Cotton Seeds by Professor S.G. Stevens, Department of Genetics, North Carolina State University. This is not lip service. Saltwater tolerance of sieve or garcipium. And here's all the experiments that took place. The American Naturalist, the cotton seeds, long-distance dispersion of seeds, by retention and digestive tracts of birds. They found out on the first paragraph, the suggestion that seeds may be transported via the digestive tract by migrating birds has been rejected. Here's the information right here, coming right from the library that showed you, no, no, no. In other words, it was an African who had to bring those cotton seeds over here. And if you read Blacks and, Blacks and Science, Ancient and Modern, we find that as early as 3000 BC, the mandate, the Mandate were producing that same cotton, and you find it as early as 3000 BC, an African tetraploid cotton, cultivated cotton in the Americas. Furthermore, on his second voyage on March the 9th, 1493, Columbus got caught in a storm. Lisbon, Portugal, what happens? He goes to the court in Lisbon, Portugal. He meets the king, Don Juan. He goes and he says that all, he talks about all this new land that he discovered and his adventures. Now you got to understand what's happening here. The Portuguese said, wait a minute, now they, they're disappointed because remember Columbus did go to the Portuguese first and they said that he was a dreamer. They didn't want to deal with him. So now, you know, Columbus did have a little beef with them because they didn't support his voyage. But yet and still he brought six Native Americans with him. So the king of Portugal says, well look, he gave them some beads and he had them motion in sign language and asked them to tell them about these 
different land masses or these different islands in South America. And the first Native American, he did that. He went on, he made these different types of designs. He brought another one in. This Native American did the same thing. He took the seeds and signal in sign language and motion and showed all the, the Lucarias, Lucayas, and other islands all in South America. And the king of Portugal, Don Juan, he put his fist in his hand and he balled it up and said, what a fool am I? How did I let this get out of my hand? All of this cultivated area. And you got to understand why this king of Portugal was disappointed. Look at Portugal. This is Portugal. Look at Brazil. All oh, this land he could have had. This is all Brazil. It is, it is the largest, almost as big as the United States. Look at it. And look at little tiny Portugal. Now, at that time, the Caribbean in Brazil was a big thing. Yeah. See, it wasn't no little thing. That's a big thing then. Right, so what did he do? He says, look, Columbus, you're not a king. You're not an admiral at the Ocean Sea at this time. Isabella and Ferdinand can kill you if they want. I want you to go back. I want you to tell them that that's not landmass, that that's nothing but water. I want you to draw a line from pole to pole, from north to south, 370 leagues west to the Cape Verde. And I want you to go back and tell them that it's only a landmass. Columbus did that. He went back. He told them, this is a landmass. Uh, this is water. You don't have to worry about anything. The Portuguese didn't discover anything. This is only water. In other words, they paid him off to go back and tell the king and queen of this. And he went back and told them this. And to their knowledge, no Europeans at that time ever went to Brazil. No Europeans had ever been to South America. So they believe him. But what happens? The information got back to the king and queen of Spain anyway. How did it get back? Someone by the name of Jamie Ferrara took that information back. Who is Jamie Ferrara? Jamie Ferrara was a distinguished geographer as well as a dealer in precious metals and jewels. He lived among the Africans. He sat at the foot of the Africans. And the king and queen of Spain, Isabella and Ferdinand, wrote to him and told him, listen, I want you to come here. I have a problem with this line of deep marcation. Please do a critical analysis of this. I want to find out all you know about this. Now, when the king of queen summon you, when they ask for your assistance, that's considered a great honor. He goes and he does a critical analysis of it. And he says to them, and I have to read this to you. This is a quote from Jamie Ferrara. What does he say? Page 365. He says, I write my opinion in this matter. And I say within the equinoctial regions that there are great and precious things such as fine stones, gold, spices, and drugs. He's talking about South America now. And I can say these things in regard to this matter because my contentions, conversations I have learned, and because I am, and because of those places, it was pleased, it, had, it always pleased me to seek, learn, in other words, it always pleased me to seek to learn from those who come from yonder, from what clime or promise that they bring and said, th and said things. This is important. And the most I can learn from many Hindus and Ethiopians is the greater part of valuable things come from a very hot region where the inhabitants are black or tawny. And therefore, according to my judgment, when your lordship finds such a people, he's talking about Columbus, when your lordship finds such a people an abundance of said things which will not be lacking, although of this matter, your lordship, Columbus, knows more when sleeping than I do waking. And everything by means of divine aid, your lordship will give such good accounting that by it, God will be served by the sovereigns our Lord will be satisfied. From your respectful servant, Jamie Ferrer, August 5th, 1495. All right? So now they found out that Columbus betrayed him. Amen. Queen Isabella's mad. She have a right to be. She financed his voyage. So what happens? She goes. King Ferdinand, he writes a letter. Letters were coming in every month. He says, I want you to get in contact with me. If you cannot make it back to Spain, I want you to tell me every single thing you know about that landmass, that secret landmass. At this time, Columbus was in Cuba, and he said, I'm too ill to come back. Eventually, they did caught up with him. And according to Van Sertima, they 
brought him back and stripped him buck naked and it was said that the only reason that they didn't kill him was because of his personal relationship that he had with Queen Isabella, which I will not dwell on. I'm only quoting. So what happens? He sends Columbus back with six, six ships. The third voice, he said, I want you to find this landmass, build churches, find that secret land route. Columbus goes. He goes to the Canary Islands. Right here. He stays there a couple days. He searches for black animals because he finds that the Africans and the Native Americans were sacrificing animals. He did not find none. He goes to the, and takes the Senegambia current. All right, he takes this on into Trinidad, one day away from South America. When he gets to Trinidad, he calls it Trinidad. Why does he call it Trinidad? Because he sees three hills or three rocks that reminds him of the Trinity. Very religious man, yuck, yuck. What happens? The next day, he lands in South America, right here. Do you know Columbus refused to get off the ships? His ships landed in South America, but he never stepped foot on Native American soil. He said he had arthritis. This is St. Christopher. The one you would be celebrating, never stepped yeah. foot on there. And it was by way of the African intelligence who told, and you heard the quote from James Ferreira, that he knew about the secret land mass to the south, Brazil and South America, and he brought that information back to the king and queen of Spain. So it was the intelligence of the Africans, who he called black and tawny, that made it possible for Columbus to take that secret land mass. All right? That secret land mass. And this is how he landed in South America and Brazil by way of the African intelligence. So you have many documents. You have the oceanographic currents. You have the seeds, Garcipium hirsutum, Varpustatum, Garcipium hirsutum. These are seeds now. Garcipium hirsutum and Garcipium hirsutum, Varpustatum. Okay, Garcipium barbadens. You have the oral tradition, what the Native Americans told Columbus. You have what the Portuguese documented. This is documentation from them. So you have all of this information that deals with Columbus by way of the African intelligence. Very seldom mentioned, you don't read about it because that book is very difficult to find. Everything I quoted comes from the Letters and Voyages of Columbus by John Boyd Thatcher. It is written in Spanish, Portuguese, Italian. It's very difficult. You get lost in a footnote. He said some interesting things. It was the Moors who he learned from and had conversations with. He witnessed the expulsion of that last African general, King Bo Abdul, and then he turned the other cheek and didn't help the Africans. Now, I want to leave this subject because I want to go to my main point. That was around the 13th century. You had other voyages that took place around the same area, 14th century rather, but you had the Mandingo. Their voyages was around the 13th century and the Sungay from West Africa around 1450. We know that the Mandingos who were Muslims came to America because we found an, an African word for banana used in, in America called bok, bakokwa or bakokwa. Now the banana is not indigenous, meaning it's not, uh, it does, it's not native to Africa, it is native to Asia. However, the Native Americans are not using an Asian word. They are using an African word, linguistically speaking, bakokwa. So we know that the Mandingas were over here. I want to mention that as well as the Sungay, because I want to show these in the slides. I want to move on to America's, how the, how the Africans influenced America's first civilization called Omec. This is very important. Now, please remember, it is not just Central America or South America. At that time, Mexico included parts of California, Colorado, and Texas. So it was America, point blank. Now, we do know that at that time, this was not called America. It was called India by Columbus. He called it that because he thought he was an Indian. But it, when we talk about America today as we know it, it was the Africans who were honorary members of that first civilization called OMAC. Please understand the difference between a civilization and a culture. When I speak of a civilization, I'm speaking of something that's, that's, that stands out. It's, it, you can identify it. It's advanced in the arts and sciences, a writing script. For example, when we think of the great African civilization of the Nile Valley, ancient Egypt, Nubia, and Kush, we think of the pyramids. The great black genius, the world's, world's first multi-genius, M-Hotep, the temple complexes, the Sphinx, etc. In cultures, there were many cultures in America, but it was the Olmec culture, the Olmec civilization, mind you, who had either a direct or indirect profound influence on all latest civilizations, Maya, Inca, Peru, Guatemala, Palenque, Honduras, etc. And the Africans were part of that first civilization. That's what this next lecture is going to be on. I will now show you the slides.
This took place in the Gulf Coast of Mexico. As you can see, we're talking about the OMEC right in the middle here in the Gulf Coast of Mexico. You can take that mic. Okay, well, okay. Well, I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there. Now, there are three major areas that we're going to look at. The Olmec civilization again, began around 1500 in San Lorenzo and 1200 BC in La Venta, which was the heartland of uh, the Olmec civilization, a heart ceremonial complex. It was a ceremony religious center uh, in La Venta. These are three major areas Tres Zopates, San Lorenzo, and La Venta. The three major areas where you find 16 African colossal stone heads. Do not short term your history. These are not just Africans, these were priest kings and a ruling class, the elite class of America's first civilization called Omec. When did this begin? This began around 1858. <laughs> Mexican peasants found an enormous stone head. It was taller than a man and it was said to weigh 10 tons. Now during that time, most of your Mexican archeologists, Jose Melgar, Alfredo Severo, as well as others were astonished, they were puzzled. And they were, they were just surprised, because, and they wrote about, and they said that for the first time, we found an African presence in America. And they spoke of these as Ethiopian braids, and I'm sorry, as Ethiopians. They described them. They wrote about it. It was published in the Mexican bulletins, but very little was said about it afterwards. At that particular time, we understand not a lot was known about this first civilization. So then you had the first scientific excavation that took place between the Smithsonian Institute, the National Geographic, and the University of California. This was a joint excavation that took place. They went back in 1938-40 to Tres Zopates. They visited that, they found four other heads, then they went to La Venta. To their surprise, they found four other colossal heads. What is important about this head here? This is from Tres Zopates. This is Tres Zopates number two. This is in the order that they were found in, numerically speaking. However, when you look at the back of this head, this is what you see. This photograph, this picture, has been suppressed for over 50 years. It has never been published by the National Geographic, the Smithsonian Institute, or any traveling association. It was placed in the Smithsonian files and kept very quiet in American academia. It wasn't until several years ago that an African-American photographer, Wayne Chandler, discovered this in the Smithsonian files. Never, ever been published. It wasn't until 1985 that Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, and I quote, was able to publish this. So it wasn't until 1985 that this was published in Nile Valley Civilization, as well as um, uh, African presence in early America before Columbus never been published by any European academia at all. And you must understand why. Look at those braids. No European or Native Americans have that type of hair. Look at the thickness of those braids. Look at the details in them. Look at the African beads. Strictly Ethiopian, i.e. African braids. Could be dreadlocks. That's the front of that head. That's the back of it. Here's another close-up of it. Look at it. Unbelievable. I searched and searched and searched and I stayed on Wayne Chandler's case and the brother finally got the photograph to me and I was happy. I was happy because this is what you need. You will, you will not see this in other books. This is the front of that now. This is the color photograph of it. Notice, as you can see, the features has been somewhat deteriorating because a lot of these are out in the weather. These are priest kings, mind you. All right, notice the braids, those same braids you see there, you can barely see them now. That's why that black and white picture was very, right. very important. Right. Look at the braids now, they're practically deteriorating. Now, in my view, I would love to see some athletes, as well as some entertainers, get together a fun and preserve these hairs. This represents us in America's first civilization. I would love to see them do that. Because the Mexicans are very poor. They don't have the money. Now, you know, if these were Europeans, they would have an enormous fun going on, a housing for all of these stoneheads. This would represent them. But since it doesn't, they don't particularly care about this. Many of these are sitting right out in the park in Mexico. Sad. Sad. This is in 1938. Matthew Sterling's at that time was then 
uh, ex uh, deleted, excavated. His personal assistant was Clarence Weiner, okay? And this is him measuring one of the stone heads from Trezor Pates. He was then at that time the leading uh, director of the ethnographic department at the Smithsonian Institute. This is that head today in color, another photograph of the one. Here's it in black and white. Look at the features there. Look how, how those features stand out then, okay? That's in 1930. Look at them now. Still there, but they kind of deteriorated. You, can very see, you can't see them as much. Very important. Now you see the importance of those black and white photographs. This is Matthew Sterling's, and then you see one priest king from the Vintage. This is said to be 11 feet tall. 11 feet. This is from Trezor Pates. Now, I had some students, incidentally, I'm doing 15 speaking engagements on the African presence in America and the profound scientific and technological impact that they left on America's first civilization. Uh, I'm all the way up the Internal Revenue Service, 11,601 Roosevelt Boulevard. So you know, if I sound a little hoarse, it's because I got a long way to go. Many more speeches. I had some students, or rather some teachers. I was at Strawberry Mansion this morning, Simon Gratz yesterday, and on Comcast Cable Monday. Some teachers said, well, I'm not sure if that's African because of the slanted eyes. Uh, it could be an Asiatic type. Now, I like to say that if that's not African, look at those slanted eyes, then that's not African. <laughs> Plain and simple. You find African types all throughout the Kalahari as well as South Africa. You will find them among the Khoi Khoi, misnomered Hottentots by Europeans, and the Sana people, misnomered Bushmen by Europeans. You will find what's called the epicatic eye folds. Why do Asiatics have them? They have them because in, the sand, in Asia you have a lot of sand, you have a lot of wind. It helps them to keep the sand out their eyes. You find African, unmixed Africans with those same slanted eyes. Right here in West Philadelphia you had years ago Clarence Tillman. You remember him. Look at those slanted eyes on him. So if this is not African, then that's not African. This is from the Venter, a close-up. Remember, these are priest kings. What's said about this here is that some of the teeth are missing. According to Dr. Ivan Van Sederman, this is something that's very unusual in Native American civilization, something that the Africans brought over, okay? These, incidentally, were made of hard basalt rock. That's a hard, dense, dark, grayish rock. It was transported some 50 to 80 miles from the quarries and transported by, on, uh, by way of rafts to the other side of the river and placed on ceremonial platforms facing east, looking toward the Atlantic. Remember, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. They were also painted black, according to Science Digest article by Boyce Rosenberger, and they had patches of purple on them, patches of purple. Purple was symbolic of royalty. Here you see it again. I want you to understand the importance of how the Native Americans took time now. Notice the broad nose, the thick lips, the deep carvings, okay? Very important. Dr. Ivory Van Sertima said that cross that you see right in the middle there is a cross. They said that that served as a fertility figure and was something that is also brought over by way of the Africans. Something unusual at that time for America's first civilization called Olmec. Notice the cross. It is right in the middle. Notice the military type helmets as well as the straps. Right. Okay? Because I want you to understand where these come from. I'm going to speak about it in a minute where these Africans came from and prove we have a lot of evidence now that we know they came from ancient Egypt and Nubia. We will show that in a minute. Jeez, That's a side profile. You know when they take mud shots, they go side profiles, back profiles, bend down profiles. I got all kind of profile shots for you. You may as well see the African genius from all sides. As late as 1984, you still had a colossal stone here, still lying in the swamps. To my knowledge, it has not been moved. I don't know if it's because of political reasons. I don't know if it's because of financial reasons. But it's still lying in the swamps as, of late, as late as 1984. This is from a magazine called Mexico de Conocido, which means Mexico the unknown. It's unknown because the African genius is there. That's right. I sent away for this magazine. I, I, I remember seeing a videotape with Alexander von Wuthenau on it, and he showed this 
with Dr. Van, Ivan Van Sertum was in Mexico. And I, I wrote to the University of Mexico. They couldn't send me the magazine because of ethical reasons, so they sent me a Xerox copy of this. This is on the front page of this magazine. I also wrote to uh, Mexico asking for photographs as well as the magazines about a month ago. I haven't received any feedback yet. I don't know if the letter got gotten there. It's going to take more time, but this is the front cover. This is an Olmec uh, colossal head from San Lorenzo. As my, to my knowledge, as late as 1984, it's still lying in the swamps. A priest king. You have African types. Notice the Nuba king. And notice the African right next to it. Okay? So we can find living types right now that look just like those priest kings. In South Africa, same type. You've seen people that look like them. Notice the forehead. Notice the broad nose. Notice the thick lips. Same types in South Africa. Here's another photograph. The features are distorted, but as you can see, the Af I mean, the features are distorted, but the African physiognomy is still there. Yeah. Here's a side profile of it. These are out in the park. These are taken from Mex in Mexico. These are sitting right in the park in the uh, 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 park in Mexico. This is in my curio cabinet. This is made for me by my good friend uh, William Preston. Many of you know because he reprinted the book Ancient and Modern. Uh, Britain uh, by David McRitchie, The Glory of the Black Race by Al Jahaz, as well as other things. And he, he uh, had a sculpture make this about six years ago. It is sitting in my curio cabinet. It's from San Lorenzo. It's about four, I guess it's about four inches, uh, four or six inches tall. I can't remember. But I, I thought he did a very good job. For the sculpture that did it, did a very good job. These are priest kings. You know, it's nice because my son and daughter, I like when they go around saying Olmec. And I say, what kind of Olmec? African Olmec. Love it. Here's another head. This is from San Lorenzo. This is said to be San Lorenzo number two. Mm. Notice the details. Eight to 10 feet tall, eight to 11 feet tall, anywhere between 30 and 40 tons. Now remember, according to the United States customary system, a ton is said to equal what? Round figures, 2,000 pounds. This is one of my favorite. Look at that. Look at the details. It's almost like the Native Americans made the Africans talk to you. Yeah. It's almost like many of these were just done yesterday. I like to say that it's almost like the Africans, through their genetic blueprint, had a preconceived notion that somewhere, sometime in the 21st century or 20th century, somebody going to say that we were never here. I'm here, I introduce myself to the Native Americans, we're going to get down to developing the arts and sciences, we're going to build the first pyramids of its kind, just like you see in Egypt, the step pyramid as well as the true pyramid, you do not find them until you find the arrival of the Africans, and it's like the Africans said, but before we get down to scientific business, please do me one favor so that other nations cannot say that my existence was not here, take my picture. Not only did they take their picture, they carved their picture in base salt, 30 to 40 ton solid base salt rock. I'm not talking about the bedrock that you find on the Flintstones. <laughs> How did they get there? This is from the African presence in early America, and they came before Columbus. What was happening? At that time, from 1000 BC to 948, the Africans, that is, ancient Egypt, whose proper name is Kemet, Nubia, whose proper name is Nahesi, and, and, and uh, Kush, in partnership, they were at war with the Asians. What was happening? The Africans needed new trade routes. The trade routes were cut off. Let's go to the map. Got to deal with the map. The Mediterranean, as well as the Red Sea, was cut off. Same thing that the Americans did, what the United States did when they went into Iraq or Iran, they cut off their trade routes. The Asians or the Syrians did the same thing, the Mediterranean as well right, as the Red right. Sea. They cut it off. So the Africans still had to trade their goods, so they needed new trade routes. So 50% of their fleet were mercenary with the Phoenicians. The Jeez. Egyptians or the Africans left a, pr a profound influence on Egyptian, uh, mer uh, I'm sorry, on Phoenician fleets, their ships. The Egyptian ships was the effect the Greek ships, profoundly influenced the Greek ships, Phoenicians, Romans, etc. They needed new trade routes. So in partnership with the Phoenicians, they came east of the Mediterranean, they got caught up, as we are told, in those currents. We talked about those natural currents that you see. 
These are worldwide currents. This is from what I understand, the United States Oceanographic Survey. These are, wor uh, these are worldwide currents and winds. Here's Africa. Cape Verde, Canary Island. These are natural currents that will automatically oh, take yeah. them into South America. Yeah. We are told that they got caught up in these currents, and that's how they got involved in America's first civilization called OMEC. That's why how they were caught up in, in that first how they were caught up and how they landed in America. Natural currents, Cape Verde, Canary Islands, Sydney, Gambia, and the South Equatorial Current. And you see the winds take you right into South America. Remember at that time it was America, not just Mexico or Central or South America. Don't let nobody short term you. Very important. These archaeologists working on some of the heads. Notice the fine details in the carvings. This is one of my favorites. Look how that light hit that African priest king. He's almost like he's talking to you. As I said earlier, it's almost like the Native Americans carved these yesterday. Rock Porteroid, as Asia Hilliard call it. Rock Porteroid. But look at it. Look at the fine details in the nose, the thick lips. Now what's happening is that you have one of the leading uh, archaeologists of Mesoamerica, Michael Cole from Yale University, can't deal with the African fact, he cannot deal with the African genius, cannot deal with the African features. So he says that the reason that there were broad nose, thick lips, and the reason why they look so, in his words, Negroid, is because the Native Americans did not have sharp enough tools to make the lips thin and nose much pointier. When you can't deal with the African factor or the African genius, you make up all kind of excuses Sheer narrow-mindedness, stupidity, and arrogance, plain and simple. Because it's not just the heads. It is not just the Ethiopian braids. As you will see later on, 13.5% of African skeletal remains were found in the ruling class. Not the common, but the ruling elite class of the Omec grave sites. Side profile. Notice the strap. According to Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, one of these heads were flattened and served as an oracle, and that you had a hole, and one of the ears and a long tube was running from the ear to the mouth, and it served as an oracle, and the priest would go beyond, behind the head, and it would talk to the people. It almost operated as a shaman. This is nicknamed Joe Lewis, the famous boxer, because it said it resembles Joe Lewis. Notice the lips, the thick lips, the broad nose. That's what his nickname. We do have a name for this head. This is called El Rey. El Rey in the Omec language means the king. Remember, go back to your history. Rey is the Greek form of the ancient Egyptian Ra. See the linguistic similarities? Let me repeat that. Rey, the Greek form of the Egyptian Ra the name they gave to the sun as a source of creation, not as a god that they worship, a source of creation, the energy of the creation. All life sustains, all life lives by way of the sun. Vitamin D, very important. How do we get the date 948 BC? For the first time in science, they introduced what was called radiocarbon data. And what happened was they, they was able to touch some wood platform uh, they were able to test the wood that was stuck beneath some of the uh, heads, right below the heads. You can't carbon date wood. You cannot carbon date wood, but they were able to test the wood that was stuck beneath the head. You can only carbon date dead things that once lived, like uh, reptiles, human beings, amphibians, etc. And they came up with a date of 814 plus or minus 134 BC, which was rounded off to 948 to 680 BC, that we had the arrival of the African presence as well as the African genius in early America, America's first civilization. I'm not making up the dates. If you want to look at it yourself, it is in Science, Volume 126, July 12, 1957, radiocarbon dates from Leventa and Tabasco. This is the first scientific means of discovering a date of dead things that once lived. Okay? That's how we came up with the date. Here's the article, printed by the scholars, the experts in the field. I'm only here researching, giving the information back to you. 948 B.C. African genius, African factor, and America's first civilization. This is very important, very, very important. Now, I want you to understand here 
This is from Newsweek magazine. Why they couldn't deal with the African genius. You have to see this, a little small caption. Let me focus this, I want this nice and clear. It's a little small caption. Question, did Nubians from East Africa sail on Phoenician fleets to the Western Hemisphere in 1492, or rather before 1492? Answer, sculpture dated 800 BC fell in Mexico has African features. It is good, but not conclusive evidence. Let me read that again. Newsweek magazine, when you can't deal with the African factor, you make things up. The Nubians from East Africa sailed on Phoenician fleets to the Western Hemisphere in 1492, or rather before 1492. Answer, sculptures dated 800 BC found in Mexico has African features. It is good, but not conclusive evidence. This is all they print and they leave you hanging. They never mention the Ethiopian braids. They never mention the skeletal remains. They never mention the hundreds of terracotta baked clay figurines that was found, okay, that has the coloration, the hair texture of African people. None of that was never, ever mentioned. They never mentioned the rituals, the symbolic imagery, none of that. They just put this caption in here and then leave you hanging. But you have to understand why they did it. Go back to Newsweek. Fall winter issue, 1991, they already identified you as slaves replacing the Native Americans. They redefined you already. They set you up in October. Remember the article? When it was Cleopatra Black. That's the article it came out of. Then fall winter issue of 1991, front cover. Africans are slaves. Can't deal with the African factor, and you have to understand why. You were honorary members of that first civilization. To me, this brother... To me, it seemed like this brother just not, did not want to get his photograph done, did not want any carvings done. He looked like he was just in a bad mood. Yeah. Look at him. He just looked like he just did not feel like being bothered that day. And they said, well, look, we're going to carve you anywhere, but we're going to carve you the way you look at that particular time. And it seemed like that's what they did. But he seemed like he just wasn't in a good mood. Even on envelopes. University Press of Colorado was sent to me an invitation to the tour of the ancient cities of Mesoamerica. Of all other pictures, what's on the front cover? An African priest king. On our roof. So you see that the African is ubiquitous. He's in the diaspora. He's exuberant. He's everywhere. everywhere. When you see it from an African-centered perspective. Right. If you don't see it from an African-centered perspective or an African frame of reference, you get lost. You get lost. You get confused. You got to take all that information, and I've been doing this for the last five years. That's how I was able to put these slides together. Take all that information and show the African throughout the diaspora. He's ubiquitous. He is everywhere. You know, Roy S. came out with a song a couple years ago, Roy S. Ubiquitous, everywhere. African genius, even on an envelope, sent to me by the University Press of Colorado. This is an artist's conception of how possibly the Native Americans transported these 30 to 50 ton massive colossal heads from 80 miles away from the quarries to the other side of the river by way of raft. This is an artist's conception. This comes from Time Life Books. I like that because it gives you an idea of how they may have done it. Remember, they were transported 80 miles away, 60 to 80 miles away, and then placed on ceremonial platforms on the other side of the river. The material for that, the rock, the carved, this came from the Tuxla Mountains of Mexico. And this was carved from a single block of basalt rock, almost like a geometric shape. They had to cut a single block and then transport that. Now, if you look on the next page, it says, and it just goes to show you from a Eurocentric perspective, how they just can't deal with the African factor. The next page of that says, the reason that it's square, the broad nose and thick lips, and this is a quote, is because the Native Americans did not want to damage the colossal head when it was being transported to the ceremonial platforms. In other words, that once it was placed on the ceremonial platforms, the Native Americans was going to change the features. Sad. This is what they said. You can't, I mean, the features are so identifiable, so then you got to make up all kind of excuses. And this is what they said. Now, they're, they're taking this, they're, in other words, they're speaking for the Native Americans, that this is what they did. And then they put in parentheses to get themselves out of trouble, presumably. See, the English language, the power of words. Amos Wilson told you about that. Remember, in the beginning was the word. The power of words. The reason why it looks so African is because they didn't want to damage the sculpture when it was being transported. Sheer arrogance. Narrow-mindedness, plain and simple. We talked about the African skeletal remains 
in the dry areas, in the coastal regions, Cicero or Cicero de las Mises, Monte Alban, and Talatico. You found a conservative estimate of 13.5% of African skeletal remains in the ruling class of the Olmec elite civilization. This was presented by Andres Wazinski, who was a crane, uh, craniologist, a skull expert, and it was presented in 1974 to the Congress of the Americanas. And he allowed for all the variations in the mixture, miscegenation, amalgamation that took place between the African priest kings and the Native American type. And he still came up with a conservative estimate of 13.5% of African skeletal remains in the ruling class the ruling priest elite class of the Olmec civilization, America's first civilization. Very important. And these were fossils. This is taken from America's first civilization by Michael Coe. Another photograph of it. Very important. For the first time, you find the true pyramid as well as the step pyramid. When do you find them? You do not find them in American soil until you find the arrivals of the Africans on Native American soil. Where's its origin? Right there in the great African civilizations of the Nile Valley, that partnership between Egypt, Nubia, and Kush. That's its origins. Okay? Now, this is a reconstruction, all right? If you look at those, they almost look rectangle. Where was the African colossal heads found? You had an African colossal head right there, one here. An African colossal head at the top there, one on the other side. Right on those pedestals, that's where the African colossal heads was found, facing east, looking toward the Atlantic Ocean. I want you to understand that this just wasn't thrown together. Because in San Lorenzo, they tried to build that same platform, and it was irregular. Its orientation was off. This is based on a north-south axis, just like the Great Pyramid of Giza, north-south axis. All of your major elements, the cubic, the foot, the second of time, all of your major mathematical equations or formulas went into this building structure here. They had sophisticated engineering. They had to allow for a drainage system. Remember, this was built on debris and sand. So they had to allow to make sure that it would not sink. Proper drainage. They had an artisan class. They had an elite class of artisans, of craftsmen, of farmers, of, 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 of private ceremonies, of towns, etc. This here is just a diagram to show you how that, that uh, ceremonial platform was uh, being designed, how it was being constructed. And you see, once again, the true pyramid as well as the step pyramid, the first of its kind on American soil when you find the arrival of the African priest king. This is the canal, the drainage system. This is said to be about 30 tons of basalt rock. It's said to be roughly about 260 feet that was dug out. This was a drain. Remember, we talked about drainage to allow for proper drainage, all right? And that's a drainage system there. And this was sophisticated engineers that went into constructing this. Mm. Today, this is what that pyramid looks like. Back then, it was probably much better, but due to the elements of the weather, this is what that pyramid looked like now. This is the first pyramid right here in America. Now, this is your origin. There's a step pyramid, a step pyramid built by the multi-genius and true father of medicine, the black genius, Imhotep, the African genius, the true father of medicine, the man who gave us the saying, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. You had the same man who came from a family line, a tree of 25 architects. According to Sir William Isley, he was the first physician to stand out clearly from the mist of antiquity, quote, unquote. The true father of medicine, the world's first multi-genius that we have any knowledge of. A physician, an architect, an astronomer, a chief lecturer and priest, a philosopher. He is the same man that the Greeks worship as a god of medicine. When physicians take their oath before they practice their profession, it is a virtuous tribute to this African genius Imhotep, whose name means he who comes in peace. That's the African pharaoh Zosa. There are the pyramids, the pyramid of Giza. I want you to understand, you have heard it many times for Dr. Ivan Van Suren. This is extra extraordinary. This is 481 feet high, 
It is half the size of the Empire State Building, but as he said, Dr. Van Soda, it takes up 13 and a half blocks of Manhattan and New York. Imagine a skyscraper taking up 13 and a half blocks of Manhattan. If he was to cut it and one foot cubes, it would encircle two thirds of the belly of this planet. You can go underground in that pyramid in the middle of Giza. It is 10 stories beneath the earth. 10 stories. African genius. African genius at its finest. You remember, because it was on MTV a while back, we applaud the Japanese for their great technology and their sophisticated VCRs, cameras, etc. They went over there, they tried to build the pyramids, couldn't do it. They came with the Hollywood version, as you heard, the hee-haw, hee-haw, came with their hydraulic hammers and jackhammers and pavement breakers, couldn't do it, could not do it. And they said the more problems and the more that they, the more problems that they ran into in trying to construct that great pyramid, the more respect they regained for the ancient Egyptians. This is what they said. You will see them on a the video. They look puzzled. Just standing there, pouring down with sweat. The, the stones crack. They sank in the mud. And they just sat there. And you can see them with the Hollywood hee-haw, hee-haw. Finally, the Egyptian government said, look, you know, pack your stuff and go home. You're making fools of yourself. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Could not do it. That's a landscape of it. And who was it built for? The African genius Khufu. Now I'm showing you the origins of why these are the first pyramids and then you begin that same, have that same influence in America. This is very important. I want to break this down, especially for the children. Very important. This is from Archaeology Magazine. I'm going to break this down. This is very important. It is said to be the greatest ruler in history. It says it is the, these, they are the foundation of all modern measurements. They were used to build the ancient Egyptian pyramids, Sphinx, and the Valley of the Kings. They made this ruler in honor of the African statesman Amenope, who lived around 1300 BC, which corresponds to the 18th dynasty of the ancient Egyptians. And you can look through the whole line of the 18th dynasty, the Amos, the Thutmoses, the Amenhoteps, etc., and you will see nothing but African, African, African pharaohs ruling throughout that 18th dynasty, that great African 18th dynasty. What's important here is that they are saying that the foundation of all lineal measurement, all modern measurements that we use today, the arc, the cubic, the foot, the second of time, all has its foundation, its origins, its genius with the African. This is what they said. It's a ruler in honor of Amen Ope, a black statesman. According to Dr. Benny, he was a pharaoh. I'm not sure because my research did not show whether he was a pharaoh or not. We do know that he was a statesman. The Royal Cubic, there it is. I wrote to Granite Corporations in California requesting the ruler. It was about $800. I did not have the money at that time. I will be the first to tell you the harvest is not plentiful and the labors are very, very few. However, my letter went beyond customer service and the ordering department. It went straight to the president of the company. He wrote me back saying, well, look, we don't have inst uh, installment plans, but we will give you three months if you like the ruler. I couldn't get it because my financial status wasn't there, but yet and still he sent me a picture of it. Pictures are worth a thousand words. There's the picture, the world cubic. And I want you to understand those same cubic, the world cubic, the art, the second of time, these are ancient mathematical measurements or equations that went into all modern building structures today. In the ancient time, remember, in order to perceive that astronomical mathematical precision, you had to have precise astronomical data. This just did not happen overnight. You had to look up at that sky. You had to study what was called geodesy or geodetic. What is geodesy? Geo means what? Earth. Geodesy is a science that deals with the shape, size, and circumference of the Earth. 
It deals with locating certain geographical spots on this earth. The only way that America and Europe are able to do it is today is because of laser beams and satellite and radio communication. Back then, you had to have precise astronomical data. You had to study that sun and its relationship to the earth, the circumference of the earth, as well as mapping out those stars. Astronomical knowledge, and they are telling you that the origins of all that modern measurement that happened by way of studying those stars have its genius, have its origin with the African. That's African precision at its finest. I'm not saying it. Granite Corporation is saying it. So when you quote, you make sure you say Granite Corporation, makers of fine precision granite. They should know they're in a the business. They deal with mathematical equations every single day. They are the ones saying it. The world cubic in honor of Amenope, although they tell you that its origins goes all the way back to the time of the pyramid builders built by great African engineers. There it is, African genius at its finest. This is Tahawker. Okay, yeah, you read about him in the building. To Harker. We do know that as early as 1000 BC, we have the African presence in Europe, in Spain, because the Harker name is written in Catuches, in Spain, in a Libyan script that Dr. Barry Fell found. You would find most of that information in the Journal of African Civilization. So we do know that Africans preceded even the Moors as early as 1000 BC in Spain. Here's to Harker. Notice the size of them. You read about him in the Bible, but notice the, the size of this compared to that man. Now, I put that there because I want to show you this. Notice the military type helmet. Notice the double crown. You do not have the double crown until you find the, the arrival of the Africans in America. You find the same double crown on many of those Olmec colossal heads. When you take the African pharaoh who was king of Cush in Upper Egypt and you place him in the middle of those African Olmec priest kings, this is what you get. Look at what you get. There it is. Okay? Rituals, not just the heads, not just the Ethiopian braids, rituals. This is called the open of the mouth ceremony. Remember, the Africans never believed in death. It was an afterlife, a spiritual rebirth. So what is happening here? You have a snake-like instrument. He's tapping the deceased. He wants to bring him back to life. He wants to transform him. He wants him to breathe that new breath that new breath of life. Those of you who have F A asthma or emphysema, you know you grasp it for that breath. You need that breath. It is what? A sign of relief. It is new life. In the Catholic Church, you have what? The body and blood of Christ. Once you take that symbolically, you utter the words, amen, that new breath. And a baby's firstborn, you smack him on his behind, he does what? He cries. He's uttered that new breath. You know in most African Americans' funerals now, it's not called funerals, it's called what? A home-going service. Transformation to the crossroads to another form of life, spiritually. What's important about this? The open of the mouth. Where do you find it at? In the Americas. Same thing. Right here. This is found in a cave around east of Acapulco. A black bearded man. Notice the snake-like instrument in his hand. Right here. Same rituals brought over by the Africans. From the papyrus. Same thing. Notice the, notice the uh, leopard skin he has. Notice the African, the uh, priest. Notice the ritual. Notice the snake line instrument, same thing. And when you superimpose this with the one in America, this is what you have. Same thing. So there's even rituals that the Africans brought up, new customs, new ideas, an explosion of new scientific information. Pyramids to step pyramid. This is later now. The Olmec civilization dies down. It's in its decline. Around 150 BC, you have another civilization that takes place on the east coast of Mexico called Tajin. Within the Tajin, it was said to be a race called the Totonacs. Many of these Totonacs were said to be Africans, all right? What is important about this city is this is, the, this is 7,000 feet above sea level. It is the third largest pyramid in the world, the largest in the Western Hemisphere, the Pyramid of the Sun, Teotihuacan. The base of that pyramid has the same basic mathematical elements as the Great Pyramid of Giza. What's important about this is that according to two archaeologists, Jimenez Marino and Jacques Susto, he claims that some of the people who are responsible, some of them who are responsible for building that pyramid of the sun look like this. I'm sorry, this is a grid plan. This is a grid plan. What's important about this grid plan is that that pyramid of the sun was laid out on a, on, on a ruler straight, on a grid, similar to the grid of Washington, D.C. when it was laid out. This was sophisticated engineering skills. This is what some of the people look like. These were called totemites. 
Notice Mr. T or the punk rockers cannot claim the hairstyle. There it is. They were called Totonac. Fine marble carving around 250 AD. Another photograph of it. I'm gonna go through some of these very quickly now because I don't have too much time left. This is an African woman that was found right around the same area as that, uh, that pyramid of the sun. Now I had one teacher, Strawberry Mansion, said to me, well, I'm not sure that doesn't look African to me, but when you put that next to a Nigerian woman, this is what you get. Yeah. That is seven, this here sculpture is only 7.18 inches. That's what I'm talking about, about, about baked terracotta clay figurines. There you go. 4.7 inches, notice the dreadlocks. Found in the same area as that pyramid of the sun, Teotihuacan. This is a script, the Olmec script. This script deals with uh, the math. Is this deal with mathematical as well as astronomy? It was said to influence the Maya script. This is Morris Chice that we're talking about in America. Notice the turban. This is a fine carving at bottom for Peru, 600. I mean, 900 A.D. That's the time when you had the Africans and Arabs in partnership, the, the period of the Moors, okay? This is from Peru. Notice the crown. Notice the fullness of the lips. Notice the smoothness of the face, 900 AD. Africans commonly called Moors in, in partnership with the Arabs. This is, from Man, this is the Mandingo. These were West Africans also. These are the Mandingos from West Africa, and they were also in America around the 13th to the 14th century AD. We found the word, as we said earlier, bakoko or bakokwa the word for banana that was used by the Native Americans. This is the Empire of Mali, and this is Abu Bakari II during that particular time, an artist's conception. That Empire of Mali was larger than the Roman Empire. <laughs> ships, in the 13th century, ships called Mtempe weigh as much as 70 tons. It was said that you had the Swahilis, which is an East African Bantu Islamic civilization who were Muslims. They transshipped an elephant to the court of China. An elephant. You don't find an elephant on Santa Maria, the Nina, or the Pinta. An elephant. These ships may weigh as much as 70 tons. The jaguar, this is one of the symbols of the Olmec that dominated their consciousness. The oldest ship in the world belongs to the African. This is said to be the ship of Khufu. It is over 1,124 pieces, over 1,124 pieces. It took archaeologists 14 years to put this back together. It was like a jigsaw puzzle. And when they opened it up and found that the aroma, the perfume was still fresh in the wood. That's African preservation at its finest. <laughs> this is what it looks like today in the Cairo Museum. Other ships. You talk about the Vikings, nobody mentions Thorhall. Thorhall was said to be strong, like a giant. He was described as black, and he was said to be very foul mouthed. He was said to be the best friend of Eric the Red. Yes, we do have Africans who was with the Vikings when they made their voyages from Denmark into Greenland. Africans were with them. We have names, and we had definite, hardcore scientific proof. Thorhall, Thorfinn, Gutleaf, Gorm, Douglas, as you know it today, in the ancient Gaelic language, it wasn't Douglas, it was Douglas, which means black stranger. Yes, there were black Danish Vikings or Africans who were with the Vikings. Yeah, yeah. Thorhall was, they chose Thorhall, Leif Arison, it was said that he was the best friend of Leif Arison. They chose him because it was said that he was already familiar with the trade routes of East of North America and that he was chosen because he visited America before the Vikings and this is why he was chosen to go on there with their voyages. Now at that time they said he was very foul mouthed. You must understand why. At that time he was around a bunch of Europeans. Who knows? Maybe they thought they knew everything. Maybe he figured, wait a minute, I'm here. You chose me. Let me do the talking. I don't know. But they say he just cussed you out. But nothing that Eric the Red could do with him. They said he edged him to his works. This was found right here in America. This is said to be a Danish Viking. That doesn't look European to me. It's an ivory, but notice the coloring of it. Notice the eyes, notice that nose. To me, that looks like an African, in my view. Now to me, if they wanted to make that look like a European, you'd think they would have made it, what, ebony, alabaster? Notice the dark coloring that they put on that. The nose is peeling, as you can see, but look at the color. Look at the eyes. I think that's an African. It may be Thorhall, I don't know. To me, it looks like an African. This was found right here in America. 
I'm ending with two more slides. This is very important. At one time, scholars believed that the ancient Americans or the Native Americans had no ancient past whatsoever. They said that their information or their history is very recent. We can't find any ancient bones or any artifacts to show that Native Americans had an ancient past. It was, again, the African genius, a black man, as you can see there, who found bones. In 1900, he was born to slave parents. He was very interested, at, at, in, 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 uh, at, he was a naturalist, and he's, he was also interested in rock fossils. And he discovered bones. He gave this to another man by the name of Carl Swinehein. He took this information and presented it to one of the, I think, the Smithsonian Institute. And as you can see there, it says America's first patent. A chance discovery by a black cowboy early in this century led to proof of Ice Age man in the Americas. Okay? So in other words, once again, it was the African genes who led the scientific discovery of ancient Native Americans history. African genius again. It was a black man who led the explosion of new ideals and information to seek out. I'm ending with my last slide. As I said before, the Africans were the mother culture of Mesoamerican. This is from a book, and of all pictures, what did they put on there? The African priest King El Rey, which means the king, front cover of a book. Olmec, mother culture of Mesoamerica. It influenced all later cultures, Maya, Inca, Peru, Guatemala. See yourself as world historical people. Bring back self-confidence and historical memory. Get away from historical amnesia. You were part of America's first civilization as honorary members. Now you see why they can't deal with the African factors. Thank you very much.